Okay, hi, good afternoon, sorry about that um, minor IT moment. Uh, good afternoon and welcome to a fresh look at defining standards of care for home health, uh, presented jointly by the Alliance for Home Health Care and Quality and Innovation and the Visiting Nurses Association of America. The session is being recorded. The continuing nurse education activity has been approved for one contact hour by the Maryland Nurses Association and accredited approver by the American Nurses Credentialing Center's Commission on Accreditation. In order to receive your certificate of completion, you will need to attend this program in its entirety, complete the evaluation available on the conference app. Certificates of completion are available at the registration desk. Our faculty has disclosed no financial conflict of interest. A copy of full disclosure sheet is available on the table outside the room where I was sitting previously. And I'd now like to introduce today's presenters, but I just wanted to real quickly let you know, I'm gonna pass around uh, the attendance form so we can fill that out so you can get your, your credit. Um, so today's presenters are Amy Driscoll, who is an advanced practice nurse in the role of nursing quality manager for the largest provider of home health, hospice, infusion pharmacy, and home medical equipment in the state of Wisconsin, Aurora at Home. She is responsible for clinical oversight and continuing education for 500 clinicians and an agency telehealth program. Melissa Jordan is the Director of Quality for the largest provider of home health hospice infusion pharmacy and home medical equipment in the state of Wisconsin, Aurora at Home. She is responsible for clinical and service quality accreditation, licensure, orientation, risk management, telehealth coding, and information health information services. Uh, Jerry Ann Kelly is the Chief Nursing Officer and Post Acute Principal with McMe Associates, has more than 28 years of experience in home health care with her background in case management, hospital revenue cycle, and home care and hospice administration. She is able to see patient care through the eyes of a clinician while monitoring financial strength in home in health care organizations. Her understanding of clinical, operational, and financial issues that acute and post-acute providers face allows her to lead her team in providing the best outcomes for her clients. She helps providers meet clinical documentation standards and ingrained processes that improve consistency and accuracy over the long term. Um, thank you so much for coming today and presenting. Um, I'm going to turn it over to you all and let you get started. And that would be you first. Thank you so much. I want to make one quick correction. Thank you so much for the introduction. However, since we turned in our paperwork, somebody's title changed, and it didn't quite get to the printing. So on behalf of McBee, we would like to give this gift to Melissa, and I'll let her open it and then ask her to actually um, read it out to you guys. Okay, how about making somebody cry before they talk? <laughs> All right. All right, is everybody ready? Because you know what we're going to do this afternoon? We're going to wake up, we're going to learn a bunch of stuff, and we're going to have fun. Out of regulatory need, I need to acknowledge the disclosure statement for you guys. We three, oh, that sounds funny. I could make a lot go with that. Do not have a financial interest or arrangement or affiliation with one or more organizations that could be perceived as a real or apparent conflict of interest in the context of the subject of this presentation. So let's talk about what we're going to do today. One thing that's not on our objectives that we will do is we're going to add value to you. We're going to give you ideas and inspiration that hopefully you're going to take back and with the other knowledge you've gained at the conference uh, these couple days, you're going to implement that and then ask lots of questions and know that, you know, if you could do the things that you're going to hear that the Aurora team did, you're, you know, that's the next step. That's the growth. So, <clears throat> excuse me, we're going to learn practical methods to efficiently manage patient care, achieve better outcomes, and at the end of the day, better uh, episodic reimbursement. 
and we're going to share some lessons, lessons and some workflows that how we got there. How did that happen and how did that improve that patient care? What's important to all of us is our people. Our number one asset in our agencies is what? Our staff. So we're going to look at how staff can learn to embrace the comprehensive documentation that needs to occur. And you're going to hear a, lot, a little bit about those ideas and how that change management is handled. We're going to cover leadership accountability, clinical and service outcomes. And really, let's just think about this. The right care at the right time right, leads to proper reimbursement and proper patient outcomes. So open your mind up to really providing that patient care. We've got three nurses up here and various different members in the audience, which are getting ready to play a game. And you're going to love it. So get ready. But anyway, so today, let's have fun. We've got a fairly small audience. So feel free to, you know, if you really have a burning question, of course, we're going to take questions at the end as well. But to ask those questions and enjoy your afternoon. And you're lucky I didn't do what I normally do, which is everybody get up. Turn around, do the hokey pokey, and sit down. All right, now we're ready to go. All right, I'm going to turn this over now to our chief nursing officer, at Aurora, at home, and let her cover uh, the beginning of our slides. Thank you. All right, so I will say that for those of you who attended Barbara's session prior to this, this is really going to be a nice tie-in um, as we move forward. I'm going to start a little bit talking about Aurora Healthcare for those that aren't familiar. So um, you heard from our bios that we are the largest home health agency in Wisconsin, but also looking at 15 hospitals, 150 plus clinics, pharmacies, et cetera. So really looking at how we function as an integrated system from this perspective. Looking at coordinated care, and the reason I love this slide is if you look at one of the circles, you can see the system value of home health because um, home care is listed here um, and really looking at visit volume from year to year, not just looking at the inpatient setting, but also including ambulatory and the home health side of things. This is something that we um, started when I came to Aurora at Home and really kind of looking at that snapshot in time, looking at what we do um, each and every day. So our mission is to help people live well by bringing the future of healthcare to the place they call home. So we are a home health, hospice, um, home medical, infusion pharmacy type business. When we put all of our um, product lines together, we service over 12,000 patients as our active census. Um, home health census is about 2,500. And really looking at, again, over time how we've grown. We've really been able to increase our home health census. We've been adding caregivers, which is great to see. And Amy will speak a little bit later about our telehealth program and the outcomes that we've seen with that and really kind of how we, how we built that and put that together. But you can see here that in last year, we had over 116,000 monitored days with telehealth at the same time maintaining a 30-day readmit rate of 5%. Okay, so that's less than half what our agency average is when we look at, at all cause. So I think that um, telehealth is gonna be something that if you don't have a program or you, you have questions about your program, Amy is definitely um, your leader to talk to. Okay, so I am going to actually turn it over um, to Amy now because she's the fun, well, Jerry Ann's pretty fun too, but she's more fun in the group as far as getting us engaged with activities. Sure, thanks. Hello, so my name is Amy Driscoll, and I'm just gonna go over a few slides before we play our game, just to kind of reiterate what our, the focus of our presentation is gonna be. It is gonna tie in really nice from what Barbara had talked about in the last session about how to really use data to drive your outcomes. And what we're gonna do in this presentation is take a deeper look at our organization structure, our program workflows, and the tactics we're using to drive our outcomes. In addition to that, we're also gonna kind of give you some strategies to maintain the sustainability of these programs because we all know that we don't wanna be chasing at straws. You don't wanna let one ball fall while you're trying to catch another. We wanna to try to look at the big picture and make sure everything is working in unison. So just like we like our clinicians to use an SBAR validated format, we're gonna use that for organization assessment. So while you look at these, think about your own organization. Think about how you function, how you're structured. So this is an organized, validated tool to really articulate our expectations and our recommendations going forward to improve our outcomes. 
So at your organization, what does your quality program look like? Is it actually a term quality program and who actually owns that? Is it a quality analyst or a department or is it an all body, all encompassing team? We really had some eye opening learn lessons over time that it cannot be a simply a quality department that's running the show or you're always going to be chasing something, trying to make it better. What's the next thing we have to work on? Then looking at your background information, looking at your quality program and what, what you've tried and why didn't that work and how can we use those concepts and best practices to push that forward? Giving a good analysis and then the recommendations, which is the crucial part of the SBAR, which is what are we going to do and how are we going to work together and how are we going to work as a team? So, in order for us to move forward and have relevant, meaningful examples for our adult learners in the audience, we want to really get to know you. So you're going to use your either smartphone or your tablet or whatever you're working on, and you're going to download this app. It's Kahoot.it. And you are going to be prompted once you download it to your phone or your, app, your iPad, and you're going to be given a game pin from me, and you'll create a username. So... If anyone needs assistance in downloading that, let me know, and I'm going to pull it up. Yeah, I think we got it. And as promised, the jazzy music. So this is the game pin you're going to enter, 833-8308. And as you, as you enter your game name, your username will pop up on the screen. So remember, everyone will see the name that you pick. I always have to remind clinicians that it's visible to all. All right, so we'll get moving. So ears will pop in. All right, we are gonna start. It's seven quick, easy questions. You will select the answer on your phone. How many years of home health experience do you have? So you will choose one of the shapes. And when you're slow, it, it gives you like pressure, the music changes, so. <laughs> okay, so we have the majority of greater than 10 years, but some more than 20, which is excellent. My job duties are mostly No, just pick the majority rules. If they all blend, maybe go with other. If it maybe use other, if it's all of those use other, then we can kind of see. A lot of blended roles, okay. Very good. Do you have an Oasis Planet Care review process at your agency? I always hope people laugh at that one. <laughs> it's been chosen before, you're laughing. <laughs> At our agency, we monitor and track clinical outcomes through. Yes. Okay. Perfect. Great. And number five, in our home health agency, we... At my agency, blank holds clinicians accountable for accurate documentation. It 
It's been chosen before. Okay. All right, last one. At my agency, the leadership team engages clinicians in continuing education. So that is the Kahoot. And it really helps because now when we are talking more in depth about things and have examples, we can kind of gauge it to our audience so it makes it easier for us as well. All right, so what you see here, you might think about your home health agency and say, yeah, we're kind of looking at those same things and um, I would like to say that we're going to be able to share some practical tools, some visuals to really track your performance, as well as talk about, again, how we accelerated our performance with our telehealth program. It really looked at launching different programs and looked at our partnerships, such as pulmonary rehab, um, home diuretic protocols, as well as um, looking at which population should be with the cardiac MEM devices. So um, anything else? that you guys are looking at that you might not see here. Obviously, we only put six things there, but other ideas? Yeah. Technology, OK. OK. Now, I was sharing with someone earlier, one of the things I like to say to our clinicians to try to engage them is, do you like your paycheck to be accurate? Right? And then I ask them, when they're out Googling locations before they go on vacation or are planning a holiday, how many two or three star hotels are they looking at? Okay, so that's kind of how we try to put it into the context of every single person owns quality, every single person owns the experience for that patient and the outcomes for that patient. So, when we did a little bit deeper dive, so we really looked at what is the big picture of managing care at home. And then if you were to think about your own clinical team, would you find these things? Okay, so we looked at missed triggers. Okay, so sometimes it's, oh, yeah, well, it's easier if I do everything myself versus getting that social worker in right away because the patient really should have gone to subacute rehab but decided to come home. Has anybody had that patient at their agency? <laughs> okay. Um, we would find that they were really good about documenting the refusal of care. But then what was our process to now follow up? You know, you first come home, you feel great, they've dried you out, but now day six, seven, eight, maybe that OT to help me breathe differently sounds pretty good, right? Um, sometimes we had inconsistent or um, infrequent visits, either because that's how the plan was set up or because we had a series of missed visits, right? When you look at the missed visits at your agency, are we good about documenting that there was a missed visit and are we equally as good showing the exhausted effort that was made to reschedule, okay? Why do clinicians always schedule visits on the day they know they're gonna go to the wound care clinic? because it's one less visit to do that week, right? That's a freebie. So looking at those patterns. If you're three times a week, do you have to be Monday, Wednesday, Friday? And are you allowed to front load on the weekend? <laughs> those are some of the concepts that were very foreign um, initially for us, okay? How many of your four visit lupas ended with a discharge phone call? I want you to think about that. So I've got, I got three different questions for you to consider. When you're thinking about your lupa rate, are you drilling it down to the discipline? Are you drilling it down by visit count? And are you drilling it down by diagnosis and then like essentially the reason? Okay, so I'll show you some of the tools that we use as a visual. And again, are missed visits being documented 
because, you know, CHAP, Joint Commission, whoever it is says you got to say these things, right? Or are we really exhausting efforts to see the patient? Why did we schedule that many visits for that week if now all of a sudden we can miss one? And if they tell you they're going to the doctor, um, how many of you have a 15-minute doctor appointment, right? And how hard was it for that patient to get there? And did they do everything from a home assessment, et cetera, teaching and all the things? I'm like, don't sell yourself short. Going to the doctor has a purpose. The nurse or the therapist coming into the home has one too. So help them see what they bring to that patient. And then my discharge phone calls. I saw a couple eyes go up like, wow, I don't know if we looked at that. And I can tell you, that doesn't just impact you financially. It impacts you from an outcomes perspective because you're not laying eyes on that patient to be wrapping up that piece. Okay? So a couple things to consider there. Now, um, targeted medical review. We were on over three years of targeted medical review before I finally said, stop the madness. <laughs> what, what do we have for programs? What, what are we maybe not utilizing well? You know, the, oh, we've done that before. How did we implement it? Did we do all of the Plan, Do, Study, Act? Or did we just do? You know, planning is the thing that we do the least, really, even though it's the first step, right? Or we, we, have, we already know how we're supposed to act, so planning gets, gets shortened, okay? So three years of target of medical review, really looking at functional limitations. How many F1 patients do you have in your agency versus F2s and F3s? And do they have those therapies? Do you have reports that you can drill down by the herd to identify, here are all my F3s that have no therapy? and maybe didn't last episode, so that you can really kind of filter quickly to see what your patient population is. Um, skilled need, how many patients do you have on service right now getting a med box filled? And how many cert periods have they had that for? Okay, when we started looking, my, my joke is that we moved a post-it note and we found the Grand Canyon. Okay, you might find that, and sometimes that's overwhelming, but better for you to find it, right? Better for you to be thinking about what are the questions that I need to be drilling into and looking at. Um, narrative notes, matching your plan of care, matching the OASIS. That's our biggest area of inconsistency. So what we'll tell our clinicians is, if you saw it and you wrote it down and it doesn't match what you put in your OASIS, one of them is wrong. Did you see it wrong? Did you write it down wrong? Or do you not realize that standby assists means they're not an independent ambulator? How many independent ambulators do you have? <laughs> okay, so there's all those different pieces that we really pulled together. Progress towards goals. Why are 60 day summaries so painful? Okay, so I realize that some of this stuff will potentially be going away, right, in time. But looking at how s the specificity of their documentation, think of the change when we went to ICD-10, okay? and then really looking at those overall outcomes. So um, in addition to our independent ambulators, we love to talk about our independent sponge bathers. How many patients at your agency are a foreign bathing? Okay, we have a joke, you know, you put your head on the table and you're able to touch your feet and you're able to do all those different things, but really think about it. You can drill down to some very specific questions and really have your eyes opened about what your data is showing you, okay? Little bit of our journey, okay, so these are just some of the highway lights. We are CHAP accredited, but we switched our EMR back in August of 2011 and really started to partner some um, vendor um, solutions at that time as well. February of 2013, we, we dipped our toe in the water a little bit to look at our OASIS accuracy. Well, dipping the toe in led us to dive in head first, okay, and looking at how we then redesigned the role of the leader um, who has clinical managers over their home health population? Okay. Um, everybody reapplied for their jobs. Okay. And we really looked at what, what, what the role was. So the expectation was very clear. And it gave us the opportunity for people who were like, I don't want to meet those expectations to either be outsourced to the community or find another role. <laughs> All right. In December of 2014, we, um, we didn't just redesign our program. We kind of threw it away and brought it, brought it back out. Um, I would say that we used to have monitors in the home. Now we have a home monitoring program. Okay, there's a difference in that solution. Think about that. 
uh, March of 2015, so a little over two years ago, we did a redesign from episode management. You might say, what's episode management? So the, the buzzword would be looking at our lupas, but the big picture for clinicians is how do you manage episodes, right? Um, looking at the specialty programs that we've put together for therapy, as well as we're dipping our toe in the water looking at telehospice. So the majority of this, we're gonna talk about home care, but I w didn't wanna slight the hospice folks as well. And then earlier this year, really looking at how do we manage those patients that have heart failure, COPD, those kinds of programs that, that sometimes they are the ones that go back, okay? So a little bit about our structure. We are set up where we have um, 2,500 patients on the home health side. We have three clinical directors, and they have managers under them. So ev everyone is clinical. So uh, we have a PT and two RNs for clinical directors. Um, on the manager side, we have OTs, PTs, and RNs. And they have a census anywhere from two to 300 patients under them. So in the metro Milwaukee area, that might be five zip codes. Um, in the rural north areas, you might have 15 counties, okay? It, it, it all depends on the geography. Each of those managers has a lead. So if the manager is a therapist, the lead is an RN and vice versa, okay? So that we're really matching those disciplines as well as creating our bench strength for as we're able to promote others into new roles. All of the disciplines report to the manager. That changed with our redesign. We used to kind of have the therapy box over here and then we had the nursing over here and well, who, where are the home health aides and the social workers and the dietitians? Okay, that's all under one manager now looking at that census. And then also their leads, depending on what their census is, when we get closer to that 300 mark, they usually have two leads because we're getting ready to split, okay, to increase growth. The nurse or therapist caseload is about 25 to 30 patients. Okay, just for an idea of, of how we're set up. Now, I'm gonna turn it back to Jerry Ann. Thanks, Melissa. So, I have the honor of talking about how did they get here? How did they get here today? What was the first thing that this group had to go through? Well, there's a difference between managers and leaders, and we're probably all pretty familiar with that. You've got that manager that's going to plan and organize and going to control the situation, and you just do, 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 do. And then you've got that leader that's inspired and likes to take risks, like, likes to, you know, shake it up a bit, and they're passionate, and they're goal-oriented, and they're growth-oriented. That's what they were lucky enough to have, leaders. And I'm going to teach you a little thing. It's called the three L's. So this is a good one. You learn it. So we learned about the importance of outcomes and how to do an oasis and what all, you know, we're all learned uh, leaders. Then we live it, okay? If we don't live that mission, if Melissa and Amy had not made that path and the rest of their leadership team, they couldn't have gotten their nurses and staff to change the culture because that's what it took. It was a culture change. And then you have to lead others to it. So you learn it. You live it, and then you lead others to it. And that's where that came from. Because this was a huge culture shift for them. They went from everybody reapplying for jobs, and that's, you know, shake it up, and that's scary. But that was a perfect opportunity to set expectations. Who's going to lead? Jim Collins wrote a great book called Good to Great. Many of you have probably read it. And it's one of my favorites about the bus. So number one, right? Who knows it? Get the right people on the bus. Then get the right people on the bus on the right, in the right seat. And so many agencies will get the bus together and they're sitting in the wrong seats. You know, so you've got, to, you've got to build that organization. And one of the things I really, really like that Melissa said is there's also a pipe, there's a forward um, plan. What'd she say? Once they hit like 300 and they have two team leaders, two leaders, they're ready to break. Okay. So that's definitely saying I'm going to have a succession plan behind me and I'm going to go ahead and prep this person because eventually it's not going to be two of them. They're each going to have their own. And that's a good, strong succession planning. So it's important to think about that. The other thing that happened during all this transformation, and it was really fun to sit back and watch it. <laughs> why we become consultants so we can sit back and watch that detail and just help on the side is change management 
Another great book, if you haven't read it, is by John Cotter. It's called Leading Change. It's an eight-step uh, change management program. We utilize it with even when we have new clients. And the eight steps, when you follow them and you create a guiding coalition and a sense of urgency, and you, know, you, you have the same values, and that's what they had to do. So through that leadership team, there became buy-in from the staff, and the culture finally started to shift. And it worked. And they spent time, and they should be congratulated on that huge undertaking, and it continues every day. So here's something that you need to spend a lot of time with your staff on. So, of course, we have all, all the important things in home care. We've got the case mix, and we've got outcomes and we've got the financial risk adjustment i'm not going to read them all you can read five star clinicians tend to get into this tunnel vision kind of thing where i've just got to worry about the questions impacting the herd because that's all i heard melissa tell me that's not what melissa told you she told you to do it right you're in the home and one thing that i tell clinicians is this you're providing great care you're telling me, we're talking through it, but if I just read this chart, I'm not so sure. Clinicians need to take credit for the excellent care they're providing, and it needs to be a whole picture. So it's not one area or the other to work on, it's just working on documentation. It's working on everything together, and mostly, you know, clinicians at heart, they wanna provide great patient care. We need to help them provide it and put it in the chart, because at the end of the day, they should be proud of what they did, and that patient's outcome should be positive, and the agency's reimbursement should be accurate. So <clears throat> Amy's going to join us next, and she's going to talk about toolkits and really cool stuff that I'm sure you'll enjoy. Okay, but no more games. <laughs> Promise. So we're going to talk about the toolkit, because as we know, culture change takes time, and it's not effortless. It was a struggle, and struggle the, we're talking about the bus. It, th this takes time. This takes a whole toolkit. Our recommendation is that it doesn't matter exactly what tools you have in your toolkit, but have a full toolkit. And always have something on the horizon that you are striving for next, so that there's not a gap and you're seeing the big picture all the time. The people, I think, is the most important aspect that we had to have good grasp on right away. So changing our managers to leaders, helping them coach, and giving them the tools to really help clinicians become the champions of quality. Like Melissa had said earlier today, you have task-oriented managers, you have task-oriented clinicians. We really wanted to change that and not just be tasky, but how are we impacting the big picture of the patient? How does this impact the entire organization, the whole system? We're lucky to be a part of this integrated healthcare system. How what we do in the home, how does that impact the hospitalizations and our overall outcomes. So partnership and collaboration was key in all of this too. So this is kind of a visual of our episode management plan. So this is kind of the nuts and bolts of how we really started our process. So we have our patient census worksheet, auto, automated reports that kind of go over the big picture of the patient, looking at our accuracies and looking at our recommendations to improve our accuracies. And that goes to our clinical leader team. In the beginning, when we tried to roll this out originally, it was the quality team trying to do this on their own. We would get the report, we would read it, and I would call them and try to track them down like three times in a row, and I would finally get them, and they're in the car, and it's, it wasn't a process that was sustainable. It was, okay, what number do you want me to change, and why? Okay, I'll change it now and resync or whatever I have to do, and they weren't learning the process. Once the leaders were involved, and Melissa said, now we're gonna change this where the leaders are gonna get this report, you're gonna have 10 to 20 cases per week to review, and we're gonna start looking at trending because that was more impactful. Instead of attacking the situation, one clinician, one recommendation at a time, we were identifying trends of where we had areas of opportunity and applying it to the masses to say, these are the big overhauls in education we need to work on as a team. So the leaders then would communicate and discuss with that RN case manager or therapist on the recommendations or the triggers to help improve their documentation. And then it became more of a culture of my leaders engaged not only was it beneficial for the engagement, but it also improved the leader's knowledge base. And when someone's more confident, they're more likely to coach and be more efficient with their coaching. So we had to get their knowledge base up too. It's probably not until you really make your clinical leaders 
coach their caregivers that you understand how much they really don't know. Mm -hmm. That was very eye-opening for us. Right down to the accuracy of understanding the Oasis questions, they had to know it inside out. The Brown Book, does everybody know the Brown Book? It's like the Oasis Bible. Everybody had one, but they blew the dust off of it. And let me tell you how much they started using it once they were responsible. And it wasn't the education team's responsibility. It wasn't the quality department that was doing that. That was key. Learn, first out. Yeah, it really was that real-time feedback because you, you really got a good sense on do you fully understand what we are trying to do and do are you seeing the big picture? So in addition to our documentation accuracies, we're also looking at different types of discipline utilizations as well. Segwaying into that, we're going to talk about some other disciplines. So part of the episode management process is looking at how are we utilizing our episode? How, who are the disciplines involved? We really do value a multidisciplinary team approach, and we also value how we talk about other disciplines in the home. So when we talk about telehealth and that other presentation we were in with Barbara prior to this, she asked me about the barriers. Well, why are some of your seasoned nurses not utilizing these different services like specialty therapy programs or telehealth or different things that we offer? And I think culture change is hard. And someone had said, well, they think it's going to be more work, or they don't understand the value of it. They don't understand the why behind it. And so we really have done a really nice job in episode management, helping people understand why it's important and best practice for these different disciplines to be in the home, and then how to talk about it. I can easily see, if I'm a nurse, talking to a patient saying, would you like someone to come to your home and help you breathe a little bit easier to complete your daily activities that you'd like to do? Or if I said, would you like to exercise tomorrow at 2 o'clock? Patients, it, how you speak about different disciplines and how you are reaching out to clinicians to say, this is why and this is what the discipline can help you with, I think that's a big barrier. So with telehealth, we've had a definite culture change. We started our program when we did our revamp. Uh, with 84 patients. We had about 100 monitors, and now we have over 400. And it's a successful program with a sustained readmission rate that's lower than our agency readmission rate for 30 days. We've had over 3,400 patients served and 116,000 plus telemonitored days. But I can tell you, if you look at the literature, the support and non-support of telehealth varies on every article you read. And there's not a lot of literature in home health in general, so you have a very small sample to look at. And I can tell you not all programs are created equal. Our program's unique, and it's been working for us. And the reason why it's been working is because we know that patients have multi-morbidities. Someone else had said earlier that I thought was really insightful to bring up that it's not always the primary diagnosis that's leading you back into the hospital or causing you to have different strains with your utilization. It's all of the chronic conditions working together against each other, et cetera. So we want to be making an impact and really bringing in our disciplines. We want the right patient in the right program at the right time. And that's how we're talking to patients about it and when we're bringing it up. With our telehealth program, it's unique because we're not focused clearly on our parameters. We're not focused on something's trending. It's what's going on with this patient? Who are the disciplines involved? How are you doing with your biometric markers? But also, how are we case managing you? So we do random check-ins. We don't just focus on people out of parameter. We do uh, care calls, we call them, where we check in with patients at least weekly. And we do teach back. We're here to help the nurses, and we want to support our clinical and service quality outcomes. So we're doing teach back on medications. Side effects, the little word that I feel like patients do not remember ever in any survey is side effects. We say side effects a lot, and we like them. And we do a lot of teach back. And at first, the nurses were like, oh, telehealth, we've had it for a while. All they do is call me, and I have to go make a peer on visit, and it's so much work, and we don't really care for it. Well, then when we started having nurses function at the top of their license and actually get involved with the providers, be proactive, start diuretic protocol orders, the nurses in the field said, whoa, this is something that's helping me. They have the main computer and the doctors at their fingertips in the office when I'm running around. How can we utilize each other a little bit better? So our program has over time turned into, we are the ears and the eyes in the office helping you. We, you know, we've identified something's going on with your patient today. We're calling Dr. So-and-so. Is there anything else you'd like me to ask or relate to that provider? And they're like, wow, you're, you're calling the doctor. You're starting orders. And now it's a well-oiled machine. So it's a case management model that we use that's been really working. So this is just an example of our outcomes for our monitored days. In addition to telehealth, we also have other types of disciplines that we really want to focus on. That's specialty programs. So, for example, 
During episode management, we identified that we weren't always efficiently use, utilizing our therapy visit sets. So they were getting in and out very quickly, but patients were still being rehospitalized and they weren't being managed to the fullest extent of best practice. So we had one of our rehab educators come in and really examine best practice. How are we supposed to be taking care of patients with these chronic conditions from a therapy perspective? How are we looking at pulmonary capacity? How are we playing off of what the nursing education is with medications and falls and quality of life and knowledge of their process and using different validated screening tools that we can embed into the EHR to really help drive home what is our discharge plan? What do we expect them to do at the end of this episode to say it's success, a successful transition back to the community? So we've been putting those into place and that's also been something that with episode management we're looking at as an encompassing big picture perspective. So just an example of the episode management kind of thought process, we look at a variety of things and we have it color co uh, coordinated for you if, if you have the same EHR. However, it comes over, it looks at different things. So it looks at the HERG, it looks at their diagnosis, their referral dates, how are we writing their visit sets, are we front loading? If they are sent to the hospital for a transfer and we're bringing them back on a resumption, are we re-front loading? How are we managing this patient to really have them have a successful home care episode? Looking at the disciplines involved and disciplines that were referred. They refused therapy on day one. Well, let's try it again on day three. Now they've been home for a few days. If they really need therapy, let's talk about it again. So these calls that we're having in, the, in these clinical coaching sessions really help the clinicians see the big picture on what does this patient need to have a successful episode, which in turn gives you better outcomes, and which Melissa will share with you. I'm going to go through these a little bit quicker, um, but showing you our quality scorecards. Okay, so we have something that we call our care management impact score. Our care management impact score is like a grade point average, okay? So 4.0 is your A, and we go all the way to F, okay? So we look at that location by location, as well as month by month. So you can kind of see over time, okay, so depending on where you're at. So when we, when we benchmark, we look at quartiles, okay? So if you're in the bottom quartile, so you're 25% or less, you are getting an F, okay? You show up as red. Everything is color coordinated, coordinated into the program so you can you see the red right away, right? You see the teal right away, okay, Aurora teal. And being able to look at all those different pieces. So whether it's patient safety or if it's a process or an outcome measure, you can see the star measures on there, looking at utilization, hospice. And then I also put our CAPS data on here because you need to be able to kind of look at all the way through and identify like, wow, your stars look good here, but not so good here, right? So looking at it across the way. So don't underestimate the, the visual tools. It was actually a shared governance member that said, Melissa, I think that you should be able to show us that each month and we should see where we were. I used to put them side by side, but that's not as easy as it's right there. And now when I show it to the team in my monthly report, we have arrows going up and down to show real quick where did we move. And every single team has the same kind of scorecard. Okay, so whether it's clinical quality or service quality, they can see what percent top box was I last month and what was my rank, and, and same thing um, for both. So looking at um, STARS again, so we are a three and a half star agency for the clinical side and four star for CAPS. So are we perfect? Absolutely not. Are we on the journey to get there? Absolutely. And don't wait to tell your story until you're perfect because nobody's going to want to hear it then, okay? They want to know that you're mired in the muck with them, right? How are we wallowing out of the mud, okay? So these are just some example dashboards. Um, for SHP users in the cloud, crowd, you might see like this is, this is something that, that you have with your teams. Make sure each of your leaders has their own dashboard. Make it easy for them to be able to see their stuff. If you don't know how to go in and create all those dashboards and share those, those views, call SHP. Call whatever vendor you have that you can do dashboards with to make sure it's easy for them to find it. You can run reports. You can do everything right off that dashboard, okay? Episode management. Okay, so again, the metric is really looking at lupus, but the big picture is how are you managing the care? Why did they only have four visits? Why did they only have two visits? Okay, so um, was it anticipated? So the first thing we did is we color-coded by, here's your rate, here's your percent unavoidable, here's your percent avoidable, okay? I would tell you that I felt like we had the whole state of Wisconsin catheter care under our 
<laughs> on our service. And when you start looking and they're F1 and you're like, and they've been on for six years and you're like, Okay, so that really helped us very quickly um, drill by diagnosis and look, are they really homebound? Why can't they go to the clinic? Well, because they like us. Well, CMS isn't going to buy that they like us, okay? Show us on our CAP survey. <laughs> um, what's the reasons things were avoidable? Drilling down into that. Is it the same clinician that refuses to put therapy in the home or doesn't front load? Or we say front loading is three times in seven days. That's not day one, five, and seven. Okay, and that's what we see. So I'll tell them, it's not the letter of the law, it's the spirit of it, okay? How did you truly do this? And giving them permission. I don't know if you have a different team on the weekend versus the weekday, but that whole idea of, I'm gonna put a visit on Saturday, like the, the sky may come crashing down, okay? We do what the patient needs, doesn't matter what day of the week it is or time of day. We're in home care, right? And then knowing that um, things are never a smooth, trend line. Okay, so we started a little over two years ago. Our looper rate was 18%. Okay, if anybody's stomach just didn't go, oh, you might think, yes, we were better than them at something, right? <laughs> so we just had our, our call um, earlier this week. We're at 6% now. Okay, it takes looking at it. It takes hard work and it's consistency. Okay, um, if you look overall, when we look at our, at our big picture, how do you benchmark yourselves? Okay, so we're actually a member of a link group. So it's um, 12 or 13 large health systems that are integrated. So partners, Intermountain, Banner, Sutter, um, all come together and we benchmark against ourselves because we're not direct competitors, but we're large industry leaders that we wanna make sure, I don't wanna just benchmark myself against myself. How do I make sure that, I, that I'm moving us forward? Okay, so that's kind of how we look at some of the episode sites. Finance, okay. If you have a product that you're looking at somebody giving you recommendations, please make sure you're looking at how often you take those recommendations, okay? The rule for us is that if you get a recommendation because your Oasis or your, and your narrative do not match, I don't really care which one you change, but one of them is changing. There's not an option with a recommendation to do nothing. Okay, you either make that narrative match the Oasis, which we all know that typically the narrative is what's right, okay? That's, they're, they're spitting it out. It's helping them understand the choice you made in your Oasis is not right, okay? Because these are the rules. They don't care about the patient's insurance. They don't care about all those things. They just wanna take care of people. If we give them the chance not to document at all, we know they'd all take it, right? So, but that doesn't really help us. Um, Again, using your tools to look at how has it changed over time? So I'll tell you, we were never gonna go to jail three years ago for elevated case mix because we were at 0.83, okay? And I was like, I don't mind wearing orange, but we definitely weren't gonna go there. Now, I just want you to look at how it's changed over time. Look at how we've closed the gap, and that's what's important, and that is study. I always say it's like weight loss. It doesn't, just doesn't go down. Case mix does not just go up, okay? Lupas do not just come down. You've got to keep making sure that it's hardwired as you move through it, okay? So that's a three-year period of time to change to finally get pretty much where the benchmark is. But who wants to be at the 50th? None of us, right? That, that's a C in my book, the 50th, okay? Hospitalizations. So this is some telehealth data that we have. So um, in the middle, you can kind of see the number of patients that were on census in that month. The green number at the bottom is showing the number of patients who were hospitalized in that 30 days. And then the top will show you what the rate was. Okay, so you can see anywhere from four to 7% over a 14 month period of time. And I can tell you, look at the difference of, we started with 286 patients in a month, and by February, we were at 442, and I don't remember what we were in March, but we continue to grow. Our program will have 500 monitors by mid-year, okay? And that's, that's the churn. Typically, they're on census for about 35 days, but the idea is not, um, the idea is more focused around self-management and self-awareness, okay? So it's not you're gonna live on this machine forever. We're gonna churn you through, we're gonna teach you the tools, and then we're gonna move it on to another patient, okay? Because you're gonna get a scale. You're gonna get a blood pressure cuff. You're gonna get those things. And if you're not, well then there's another patient who wants this program that will. Our goal is to have 20 to 25% of our census on telehealth because the outcomes speak for themselves. So when we look at our full census of how are we doing with 30-day readmits, um, green is a great color, right? 
So they're not all green, but we're getting there. So what I'll tell you is even if they're not on telehealth, they can apply those concepts to their other patients, right? So it's not just, I only do this if I have a telehealth patient, but how are we moving and applying that information going forward? All right, take home messages. So having your process mapped out. Clear expectations, right? There's a workflow map, so I know step to step. If you don't have Visio or somebody else doesn't, you can do the same thing in Excel with boxes or PowerPoint or whatever it is. But really being able to look at it and saying, I'm gonna know, I know exactly what is expected of me. Leaders, do you have the right ones? Are they able to coach? How are they with change? Like Amy said earlier, if they're task focused, their clinicians will be task focused. And any bench strength they're creating will be task focused. Okay, so it's our job as leaders to make sure that that's not where they get stuck. Partnerships, internal and external. Okay, so when I talk about pulmonary rehab, we didn't create our own pulmonary rehab program. We looked at how do we make sure we hand these folks off to that team. Um, collaboration. How do your disciplines talk to each other? Is everything through messaging or I left a voicemail but we never actually interact to see how Suzy Q is doing, okay? How do we make sure we have the right things in place? Visual tools, we use a lot of visuals, a lot of colors, things that pop because they understand it. You can even make it simpler. Gas gauge, everybody knows what a gas gauge looks like or a speedometer, how close are you to the 75th? You wanna to be top quartile, right? So we try to look at some of those tools as well. Visits. What it, how are they timed? When are they tapered? Sh shouldn't have three times a week for 60 days and then boom, you're just done, right? So that's a lot of what we do with telehealth is we add in that education so that nurse can back out. So you might have PRN visits, but they're timed when you need them and not, well, I go three times a week because that's what we do with this kind of patient population. Um, referrals, right disciplines, right programs, really looking at that full episode, okay? And then also programs. So where is the expertise? I can tell you that our telehealth nurses feel a different level of nursing elevation now than they ever have. Now we have an opening, there's eight people right away applying because that's the program you wanna work for. It's not the, oh, those are the people that call and bother you. It's those are the folks who support us. Okay, so that's kind of a nutshell of how we really looked at how do we align what we need for the patient and how do we turn that into what the goals are for the caregivers as well. Okay, so I don't know, we probably have two minutes left, but any, any questions? Yes? On the telehealth, how many patients does the telehealth nurse manage and what does the team look like? So I think we have to repeat the question and have it recorded, so we run it. On the telehealth team, what does the structure of the team look like and then how many patients does the telehealth nurse manage? Sure. So on average, we have about 80 to 100 patients per full-time FTE. So with our census right now, we have three to four registered nurses working every day and two clerical staff that manage the whole census. So about 420 monitors now, two clerical full-time staff. So we typically, like I said, have two to three to four, depending on census growth, we flex it depending on census for that. Okay, right here. There you go. Thank you. So um, we work with a lot of providers that similarly have telehealth. Uh, one of the things that we found, in, and you actually alluded to it, I don't think you all gave yourselves credit for it, you talk about the switch in behaviors you found when the clinicians were able to work to top of range. That doesn't happen unless governance supports that we're resiliently and resources it appropriately. So kudos to you, give yourselves, give yourselves credit for that. Um, two other things that, uh, a question and a comment. One of the things that we learned in addition to the comorbidities is that our providers found uh, relevance and credence if they looked at the behavioral health status, whether you do PH9s or whatever, because sometimes that typically preceded actual changes in behaviors that ultimately led to abandonment of therapies or a readmit. And then um, the question that I have is, what characteristics or criteria do you use to evaluate patients that you determine would be appropriate for your telehealth? Or Because I'm assuming that with your success, likely you have identified an appropriate algorithm to bring somebody on. 
So originally, before we did the program reboot, our telehealth program was primarily focused on post-cabbage surgery patients. So we call them rapid recoveries. We see them for six skilled nursing visits and then transition them to cardiac rehab. But we really found that the data didn't support that as being a vulnerable patient population. They're usually younger in duration, more walkie-talkie, and they're off service very quickly. So what we did is when we looked at the best practice, we really wanted to do population management. I'm a geriatric CNS by background, so I wanted all of the vulnerable elders in the program. So we look at chronic disease, especially COPD, CHF, diabetes, and pneumonia, but any older adults with, or even younger patients that have chronic illness, we offer them the program as our standard of care. We really are hardwiring telehealth as standard of care with skilled nursing in the home because our success, like I said, is coupled with in-home nursing and telehealth together. It's not one or the other, it's the team together that makes it impactful. Okay, so is it, is it just restricted to diagnosis or are you also looking at socio-cultural factors and other ability to follow directions? Yep. The, um, you get permission, that, that, cu that patient tells you, yes, I want this. Yes. There, okay. We look at other factors such as risk for rehospitalization. Um, exactly. So when you look at our rates being from four to seven percent, it's not because they're the well, they're the easy patients to take care of. Typically, they're the harder they're the patients sickest. to take care of. So it speaks even louder. Any more questions? Thank you. Thank you.